Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Toya. I'm a recovered alcoholic and supremely grateful to be sober. I feel a little bit hectic. I was at my home group tonight and it was great to, I love the format here. I love that you read the traditions. I love that you talk about tradition five, the primary purpose of this group to carry the message. That's my primary purpose in life today, to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. How fortunate am I that I have a purpose in life? I have meaning. Some people go through their whole life right to their dying day, wondering what's it all about? Why am I here? Thank God that alcohol beat me to a pulp, to a point of absolute submission. And uh, because I had asked God that question, why am I here? If I'm here just to earn money, to buy things and pay bills, if that's it, I'm not having it. I'm out of here. And I had made my uh, mind up that I was going to end my life. And uh, so, yeah, I am in Perth, Western Australia. My home group is the Rockingham People's Group. Um, I've just come straight from there. And uh, my sobriety date's the 26th of March, 1994. Because of this program and the God of my understanding and the love of people like you here today, I haven't needed to drink since that first meeting on the 26th of March, 1994. And uh, maybe it was a miracle that I survived long enough to get to Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's not a miracle that I've managed to stay sober because out of that desperation, I, I followed the instructions as best as I could. I'm still defiant. I'm still a bit, un, well, I'm still undisciplined, but I've done enough uh, to stay sober. And today I am happy, joyous and free. And so... Uh, it's a wonderful uh, format, again, like I said here, as Bill sees it, what a wonderful book of um, readings of Bill's writings. And so it's very, very difficult for me to choose one. And I could have driven myself mad uh, diving into the book and thinking and praying. And, you know, so in the end, uh, I just sort of stumbled across that one. And I noticed that it was two readings out of the big book. So that did it for me. And particularly this reading from as Vis- uh, A Vision for You, I actually have been hosting a women's big book study on Zoom every Wednesday night since the 9th of December 2020, and it's wonderful to see familiar faces here. It's wonderful to see friends in this Zoom meeting today, but also uh, those friends I haven't met yet. I was told there's no strangers in AA, only friends who haven't met yet, and that's um, it's a beautiful thing. And so in that big book study, so this reading comes from Chapter 11, A Vision for You. And Chapter 11 is like a a bit of an overview of the history, a summary chapter, a conclusion, if you like, to the first 164 pages of the basic text, the only piece of AA literature which gives clear-cut directions on how to recover from alcoholism and how to stay recovered permanently. I'm not staying sober or dry one day at a time. The problem has been taken from me. I'm not cured, but provided I continue to do tomorrow what I did today and I have done today what I did yesterday uh, and be and remain open-minded and willing and teachable to learn and to grow and to admit my faults and admit when I'm wrong I'm going to be okay there's no need for me ever to drink again and and I love I love that comfort that Alcoholics Anonymous gives me and I love the comfort of the of the fellowship of seeing familiar faces here because I'm still just human I have some anxieties, I have some nervousness, and it's just very comforting to see uh, familiar faces and names. And uh, so apparently when the book was written originally, this chapter 11, A Vision for You, excuse me, they had considered putting it at the front of the book, and I can see why, because this this reading here um, never... The old pleasures were gone. They were but memories. And that reminds me of this madness I heard in a meeting when someone said, how am I ever going to have fun again without alcohol? Excuse me, when was the last time did you have fun with alcohol? 
uh, I know that uh, the delusion that I was having fun probably clung on a lot longer than, than uh, and after the actual fun had gone out of it. Towards the end of my drinking, I started to question, did I really have such a great night if I can't remember what happened? Did I really have such a great night last night if I can't remember how I got home? Where's my paycheck? Uh, you know, what happened? And even worse than being in a blackout the night before was being in a semi-blackout or going in and out of a blackout and remembering snippets and bits and pieces and faces of people. And, and, and even as I'm talking about that now, I think, whoa, was that nightmare really my life? So I still continue to come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't want to forget where I came from. I don't want that insanity to come back into my mind that tells me, yeah, I can have a drink. Uh, it'll be different this time. And that's what this reading talks about. There was always one more attempt and one more failure. How many hundreds, maybe thousands of times in my 12-year drinking career did I say to myself, it's going to be different this time? I was a, a binge drinker party animal and uh, I drank every Friday night I went on binges and I thought that's that's why I'm not an alcoholic because I didn't drink in the mornings I didn't drink every day but I know today that because I had a loss of control I have an allergy and abnormal reaction to alcohol once there's alcohol in my body I can't stop I've got no more say in where I go, what I do, what I say, what I drink, how much I drink, whether I take other substances I've just lost the power of choice completely once I take that first drink. But without a solution, without this 12-step program and this spiritual way of life, I don't even have a choice about picking up that first drink. I can, I can be deluded in my mind thinking, oh, I'm drinking because I had a bad day. I'm drinking because I had a good day. I'm not drinking for any of those reasons. I'm drinking because I have a mental obsession that tells me I have to drink no matter what good, bad or indifferent, I will drink again. And so uh, as a binge drinker, I was able to stop at times, but I could never stay stopped. And I thought that I'm not an alcoholic because I can stop. And then I heard my story in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous as well. Uh, I, I can't, um, when I honestly want to stop, I can't quit entirely. That day always came when I when I would try again. I'd have another go. And... Um, there was that heartbreaking obsession that some new miracle of control would enable me to drink like other people. Like that is insanity. That's madness. Once I've had a go at it maybe two or three times, any person with a shred of sanity in their mind would say, well, I've tried it three or four times. It hasn't worked. I'll give up on that, move on to something else. But that's the power of this obsession in my mind, the level of my powerlessness over alcohol. And it's that insanity of the first drink. But I might just read a little bit more um, what continues on from that reading that was read here just now on page 151. The less people tolerated us, People couldn't. People wouldn't put up with me anymore at the end of my drinking. They were not happy to see me. I was not invited. I wasn't told keep coming back. Um, and uh, it's not funny. I'm laughing about it. But hey, we can laugh about these things because I'm not living that nightmare today, and I never have to live that nightmare again. What a beautiful, beautiful life. So. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself, as we became subjects of king alcohol, shivering denizens of his mad realm, the chilling vapour that is loneliness settled down. It thickened, ever becoming blacker. I don't know if I don't know if anyone can understand the depth of the loneliness of the alcoholic. Um, my loneliness was like a big, huge, like canyon kind of thing I was just so bereft so empty so disconnected and so lost no wonder I wanted to die what an absolute nightmare and I hated everyone and I thought everyone hated me I don't even know how I survived it but and, and, and I, I think it's just the grace of God I haven't done anything to deserve this life I've been given it is the grace of God which is unmerited favor it was just given to me why 
We had a moment of silence earlier to consider those who haven't made it, those who have died of this illness, those who haven't made it to the doors of AA, some people who come to AA and because it's baff cunning and baffling, they can't, can't grasp onto this gift that's being offered. So for some reason, I've been given this gift and I was able to, cl to cling on to it. And, and here's a paradox. I cling to this, but I can only keep it if I give it away. So I've got to cling on to it, but give the whole thing away and constantly think about how can I share this message? How can I carry this message? How can I try and help another alcoholic? What can I do? Uh, that's what drives me today. That's my purpose in living. And, and I'm not saying that to say, look how good I am. That's just what you've taught me to do. And what, but it, it's like, it's like if you want a nice garden, you're going to fertilize it, weed it, trim it, cut it, uh, give it sunshine, give it water. Well, with my sobriety, I do the steps. I have a home group. I, I talk to my sponsor and other sober members who are also walking in the fellowship of the spirit, people who are also in the steps, in the big book, in the traditions. So, and um, there's more, there's always more to learn and more things to do and more service. It, it's just never ending. And I love that about it. And even at 28 years, I'm learning new things. I'm doing new things. It's getting more exciting. It's getting more better. And um, so continuing on on page 151, says some of us uh, momentarily uh, we found companionship or approval. Uh, then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Unhappy drinkers who read this page will understand. I understood those words at depth. Terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. This is never going to get better. My life is useless. I'm useless. It's hopeless. The only thing I can think about is ending my life. And the reason I read a little bit more out of that book is probably one of the best things that anyone ever told me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous was read the big book. And that's what the book tells me in there. It says, read this book. And um, and so I did. I was a bookworm before I picked up alcohol and I sped read through the big book cover to cover in the space of about four days. And uh, I had a woman who was uh, sponsoring me from the beginning and she would ask me, I'd bring her with all my woes and I was full of self-pity and grief and just that mess of early sobriety. What a mess. I forget what that's like. I forget that desperation. I forget that loneliness because I don't, that's all gone. I, I've been, um, I have become happily and usefully whole. That's what's happened to me like that. I, I don't know. This, this thing just works. It just works. And I've got a wonderful, wonderful life. And so she would say to me, are you reading the big book? And I said, yes, I've read it and I gave it away. You've got to give it away to keep it right. And she said, it's a textbook. We study it. Get yourself another one and read it. And then what I did was I went to a drug and alcohol counsellor because I thought I needed outside help. These alcoholics, like what do they know? right? They're just alcoholics. I need something more. I need a professional. So I went to a drug and alcohol counsellor. He wanted to teach me how to drink. He said, the reason I didn't know how to drink properly was because I had learned to drink with other teenagers. He's going to teach me to drink because the body can only metabolise one drink per hour. Can you imagine drinking one drink per hour? Like, um, I'm fast, I drink fast, I drive fast, I talk fast, and uh, I can't have one drink in an hour. I need about 10 drinks in an hour. And uh, I'm not going to use a lift because it's too slow. I'm going to use the steps. And when I'm out there in the world, I think everyone's moving in slow motion. Um, so, yeah, I've got a long way to go till I slow down and calm down a bit. So... Anyway, I spoke to my sponsor and I said, this is what the counsellor said. See, I've got this glimmer of hope. Maybe he can teach me how to drink because I was 25 years old then and I thought maybe I'm too young, like maybe, I don't know. And uh, he's a counsellor, he knows what he's talking about. So I went to my sponsor and told her what he said and I started arguing with her a little bit because she's just an alcoholic. He's a counsellor. So what she did then was directed my attention to the big book and it says, and I can't think what page it's on now, it escapes me, 
maybe it's around, anyway, I won't go hunting for it. I think it's in Chapter 3. Uh, if you think you can drink, uh, if you think you can turn around and drink, our hats are off to you. Um, something like step over to the nearest bar room. That's right, she said. It does say in the big book, step over to the nearest bar room, have a couple of drinks, see if you can stop. This woman, my sponsor, is telling me to go and drink. <laughs> and um, I, th I thought it was just looking back, it's just a wonderful piece of reverse psychology because uh, that terrified me. Remember? Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. That's what I've got to look forward to if I think I can drink again. So when she gave me permission to go and drink and said, maybe you are different, Maybe you can drink. I thought, no. See, I'd started doing 90 meetings in 90 days and in Perth in the early 90s, all the meetings were 90 minutes. There was big, long drunk logs. People would share for 20 minutes, great big, long skid row, rock bottom, uh, bottom of the barrel drunk logs. And uh, what that did was terrified me because these were all the yet you're eligible to. I didn't know anything about jails, institutions, um, mental health. I didn't know anything about these things, but you all told me this in great detail and you warned me and told me these are the yets. If you go and drink, you're eligible too. And so I thought, no, I won't step over to the nearest bar room. I'll just leave it uh, one more day, a day at a time. I'll just stay sober one more day, one more meeting. And I never did have that drink. And as I read the book this jumped out at me and this was the second part of the reading out of as Bill sees it from page 133 these words jumped out at me we are sure God wants us to be happy joyous and free are you kidding how do I go from terror bewilderment frustration and despair to happy joyous and free I always thought I drank because I had such a terrible terrible childhood and some parts of it were pretty bad, but some parts of it were pretty good as well. And I'm not discounting any of that stuff that happens in childhood and the long-term effects. However, as a grown woman, as an adult, I am responsible for how I choose to live my life today. And Alcoholics Anonymous taught me that AA stands for Altered Attitudes. And you taught me how to have an attitude of gratitude. And the book instructs me every single day that I pray and ask for my thinking to be divorced from self-pity. And I can't say that I've done this program perfectly or anything like that. I've done a couple of things right. I've never stopped coming to meetings. Even though meetings don't keep me sober, at least I'm in with a chance. If I'm if I'm not in a regular meeting and my my minimum is uh, attendance at a weekly home group meeting, right? That's my basic minimum. But what I do nowadays, I don't even count my meetings. I don't know how many I do, somewhere between three and five a week probably, and it's easy peasy nowadays. I just sit in the comfort of my own home and go into a Zoom meeting and you carry the message to me and I carry the message to you. But what is magic about this reading on page 133, it continues, we cannot subscribe to the belief that this life is a veil of tears, though it once was just that for many of us, absolutely. The tears, the crying, I was one of those crying drunks, but then I'd flip and I'd be a violent drunk. So it wasn't, wasn't attractive, it wasn't pretty. But it was clear that we made our own misery. God didn't do it. I, I couldn't accept that for a long time because I was a victim and I thought, don't you understand? Listen to what happened to me. Listen to what they did to me. I couldn't and wouldn't accept that I was the maker of my own misery until I became angry with God a few years into sobriety because I still had these childish ideas these expectations and an attitude of entitlement in life of what I should have, like a little kid going to Father Christmas with a list and saying, this is what I want. And when I don't get it, um, yeah, the self-pity and the anger and everything came in. But here's an instruction on how to deal with that, and this is from the book. Um, 
avoid then the deliberate manufacture of misery. So for me, the deliberate manufacture of misery is repeating again and again and again my story of woe, again and again and again what they did to me. Um, it's not going to help me. It's only going to keep me stuck, make me sick, drive people away. I have done it and it drives people away. I'm telling you, they get sick of hearing it. Um, but now this... I found very difficult as well at times. But if trouble comes, cheerfully capitalise it as an opportunity to demonstrate his omnipotence. So when the going gets tough for me in life, which is the human condition, everyone has difficulties, that's just what life is like. Like nature, sometimes it rains, sometimes it's sunny, then it's a storm, then there's a cyclone, then there's a hurricane, and then there's calm seas. So that's life too, and it's it can be pretty unpredictable. So the answer here in the book or the instruction is, uh, so when there's difficulties, I, have, I surrender myself, I surrender my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him, and I hold on with faith that... God will get me through this, whether it's a relationship breakup, my daughter who was diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness when she was eight, um, she's still alive today, beautiful young woman, she's 22, she's never seen me drink, she's an engaged to, she's engaged to a gorgeous young guy who respects her and treats her with kindness and love and I absolutely adore him. Um, when these difficulties come, I hold on with faith I'm going to get through this with God in one hand and AA in the other. I can get through anything and then what's going to happen, God is going to use my experience to encourage and help others when um, these other issues happen, whatever they might be. It's, I don't know if I've still reached that point that when trouble comes, I'm going, yippee, this is an opportunity to show God's power. <laughs> so... Um, I can't say I'm there and it's like, oh, don't be tempting fate, fate now because I'm in one of these places in life at the moment where everything's just, just amazing. But mind you, about two weeks ago, that woman I told you about who was my first sponsor, she was doing step 12 when I walked into my first meeting on step zero. She was a greeter at the door. She was standing at the door ready for me and I'll never forget it. It was a um, it was a spiritual experience, and I think some of my friends here in the meeting could probably, if my internet could cut out, they could probably share my story on my behalf. But anyway, this gorgeous young woman with these crystal clear blue eyes looked straight into my eyes. She smiled at me like a long lost friend and gave me a warm handshake and said, "Welcome." I couldn't believe it because uh, people didn't tolerate me, people didn't welcome me, people weren't happy to see me anyway. So that was my introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous, a warm welcome, like a long-lost friend. And she sponsored me for a little while in the beginning, and I was talking to her a couple of days ago, and uh, sadly she did not stay sober. That's her story. She's now sober again uh, some years, but um, she did... She, she, uh, Fear off the course for a while. It's very, very tragic. But she's still alive. She's here and we keep in touch. And do you know, I don't, oh, that's right. Some guilt came up about my parenting, about some damage I've done to my daughter. Even though she, I wasn't drinking in untreated alcoholism, I can get very sick. When I'm angry and impatient and self-pitying and consumed with selfishness and self-centeredness, I'm robbing people of my presence. I'm robbing people of my love, and that's what I did to my daughter. And uh, some of that stuff from the past came up a few days ago, and I was talking to this woman on the phone, and I was crying. And I'm very private, and I'm very stoic. And she said, um, oh, that's the only time I ever remember you crying, except for 28 years ago. <laughs> and I just laughed. Of course I've cried many other times since, and we, we weren't always, we did lose touch with each other for a long time over the years. But um, I spoke to an older sober member about that, about this guilt that came up, and she's very blunt, and she said, yeah, okay, so you feel guilty, you did those things, you make amends. 
and I made some more amends with my daughter. We had some more healing in our relationship and we both cried and it was, it was a beautiful thing. But this older sober member said to me, oh, you know, you're like a dog going back to its vomit to have another go. That's what we do. We um, um, wallowing in this bog of guilt and, and it's like intellectually, I know, don't be uh, wallowing in guilt. You can't change the past. However, again, being human, feelings come up, things come up, but I've got to get on with it and move on and deal with it, deal with it at the time and keep on doing the things, the prayer, the meditation, working with others, going to my home group, showing up for service. doesn't matter how I feel. There's no chapter in the book that says into feeling or into thinking. There's a chapter called Into Action, and that's the big difference is action. I can talk about the book. I can go to lots of meetings. I can do all these things, but I do actually need to take inventory, share my faults freely with my fellows, uh, show up for service, 12-step work, whatever presents itself, that's what I need to do. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've got a lot more to share but um, I'm ju I've just glanced down at um, page 133. So when trouble comes, I can have faith deep down inside me that I'm going to be okay. God does not bring me all this way suddenly to drop me and say, okay, you're on your own now. God was already there. God has never left me. God's always been there. And I, and I can see those moments even... Um, they say that God God looks after drunks and little children, and I was certainly looked after before I got here, and God sent all kinds of angels into my life while I was drinking and definitely since I've been sober. And uh, so the book says a little bit further down, we who have recovered from serious drinking are miracles of mental health. and. Yeah, I enjoyed hearing a couple of other speakers in this meeting introduce themselves as recovered. And I, don't, I, I know people sometimes want to debate about that and everything, but I don't want half measures. I want the best of everything. I want, I want like, um, the cream and the cherry on the top and all the best. Otherwise, it's not good enough for me. So if I was just to be recovering, struggling, I can't, I don't want to do that. And I did do that in my sobriety at, at one point. As I said, I became, I went off the beam. The, my big book sat on a shelf in pristine condition and uh, I was away with the fairies. I still kept coming to meetings and thank God for the man who loved me enough to be brutally honest to me, direct to my face, and he said, uh, you should be sponsoring a whole bunch of women. You've been sober how many years? I think I was about eight or ten years sober at the time. And he said, um, you're spreading the disease in meetings. You should be carrying the message. Boy, did I hate that man. Boy, did I get a massive resentment. But he saved my life. And I went back and made amends to him later and I thanked him for loving me enough. I, know I don't have that sort of courage. I don't have that sort of courage to get right in someone's face and tell them this brutal honesty like that. I've still got this uh, little part of me that wants to be liked and I'm scared that someone's going to get angry and unhappy with me. So um, I am grateful that... I can just keep coming back, keep learning, keep growing. He actually said to me, you're not even an alcoholic because I was staying dry but not on the program. I was just attending meetings. Just because someone stays dry for a long time doesn't mean they are not an alcoholic. Uh, in the big book, there's a story about a man who, the man of 30, he could see that his drinking was going to not end well. He stopped drinking of his own accord with his own willpower for 25 years. Then when he retired as a successful businessman, out came his carpet slippers, he started drinking and he was dead within four years. No man was an alcoholic. So, But the difference is, can I not drink and be happy, joyous and free or what is my mental, emotional and spiritual state like when I'm not drinking without a spiritual solution, and I know what mine is like. I had a major second uh, big rock bottom around that time that that man spoke honest, honestly to me and told me um, 
that I was in the sickness. So that's pretty much my time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.